Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm delighted to welcome a very senior and accomplished professional from Bangalore, India, Mr. Mahadevan Shankaran Iyer, or Maha for short. Maha, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ashutosh. Uh, uh, Maha is a business transformation leader and he's a customer loyalty expert. So Maha, before we get into transformation and customer experience, tell me a little bit about your own journey in brief. So um, Ashutosh, growing up, you know, when I was studying, uh, I got a chance to study across, you know, uh, six, seven schools across mm -hmm. the length and breadth of the country. My father used to move around quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I had to you know, every two years, ever so often, we would move around. And strangely, when I started working in my first job, uh, within seven years, I got transferred four times. Wow. Right? And across geographies. So, in a sense, the first half of my life was a lot about pan-India exposure, working with different, mm. uh, you know, working and working and studying in different geographies. In some sense, I'm a linguist and, you know, that, that brought in me a sense of, you know, adaptability, mm. uh, right? a bit of a cosmopolitan outlook. And more importantly, I think the ability to reboot and start all over again. I, I think it just got, you know, Wonderful. Yep. the deep mm. The second part was when, you know, uh, when I used to work with Tata Motors, a secure, uh, well-paying job, I quit to join CIFI as their employee number five and it was starting in 96, right? Just mm -hmm. because I wanted to be part of the internet and e-commerce wave. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was just, you know, I, I think working with CIFI uh, gave me a sort of, you know, built a DNA for being able to be comfortable with the risks, right? Mm. And after that, strangely, the next 26 years of my career, literally every role I've done has been a greenfield role, right? Okay. Not, not that I asked for it, mm. it was just unplanned, but it happened. Mm. So we building a IT security business for, you know, CP, yeah. uh, you know, for someone who had no clue about IT. Yeah. And then you know, building a business transformation practice for Donnelly or Tesco, mm. for starting off customer loyalty and analytics at, uh, uh, you know, at, at a landmark group. Literally every role was greenfield. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it, two things, it, and then I also fortunately had the opportunity to work in international geography. Mm -hmm. so I think that bit of it gave me two exposures. One, one is be comfortable with ambiguity and be like an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And two is, uh, you know, obviously understand, have a reasonable understanding of international markets. Wonderful. So recently I said, okay, these learnings are good enough. Can I actually use them uh, to do something on my own? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is my third pivot, so to speak, where I decided to start off as an entrepreneur. Wonderful. And, uh, you know, started my own marketplace for you know, mm. global on-demand analytics. So, so that's broadly my... Fantastic. Thank you for sharing this. So, you know, uh, let's talk about transformation. Um, tell me about the work you do in this area. So I have had the opportunity to work on both sides of the value chain spectrum. So on the growth side of it, you know, using customer experience, you know, improving customer experience to see, you know, what type of uh, projects, transformation, initiative mm. that we can take, which can essentially improve customer connect, customer lifetime value, uh, right? Mm. And so, you know, how do you get the organization to be more customer empathetic and customer centric, right? Mm. So, so what, what does it take? And on the operation side of it or the supply side of it, you know, implementing lean or process reengineering, robotic process automation to improve efficiencies. Right? So I've been fortunate to have exposure on both sides. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, so that that's broadly the amount of work that I have okay. done. Mm. Uh, my predominant exposure has been in, you know, retail and services companies where mm. I've led work. It's very interesting. So, you know, I, was, I speak to many people on the subject of transformation and someone told me that, Change plus growth equals transformation. <laughs> what is your perspective? Yeah, I agree with the slight addition to that. I mm -hmm. would say change plus profitable growth equals sustainable uh, transformation. Okay. So, you know, uh, so what I've seen is any program, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you invest in that and if it doesn't, if it makes a net operating loss, right, mm -hmm. then that program is not sustainable. It may stay on till that particular leader is there and the mm -hmm. leader moves on, then the project doesn't, you know, the, the transformation doesn't sustain itself. Very interesting. So, yeah. So I think any program uh, of transformation has to mm -hmm. ensure that there is a net positive effect operationally. Mm -hmm. uh, only well then is it Yeah, well said. My next question is, uh, you know, Maha, most people, and I'm sure you've seen this in your uh, corporate life also, most people like status quo. 
Very few people like to change. Uh, how do you persuade leaders to transform? So uh, I use a combination or, or rather I've used a combination of what I call as the pull and push mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, the, see, the transformation happens best when the leaders are have actually bought into it and they lead the transformation. Mm -hmm. right? uh, you know, a transformation uh, agent by himself or herself can't transform to the leader believes in that, right? Mm -hmm. so the way I go about doing it or I've been doing it is you know, get them exposed to what is really happening. What could what could it be in terms of opportunity for them, mm. for their business, etc. Right? Get industry leaders or change leaders and come and speak, have brainstorming sessions. Mm. And what you would see is out of a bunch of leaders, there will be few who will be early adopters, and mm. who, you you know there are people who will be dominant, and there will be laggards, right? Mm. So so when you are able to identify those uh, adopters, uh, my method has been to give them disproportionate support. To mm. ensure that they are successful and heroes at any cost, right? right. I mean, you said any yeah. cost, not for lack of, you know, execution or support. Mm. And once they get there, then you use the push by ensuring that you, uh, you know, you publish scorecards and you keep nudging through the leadership the others. And, and then mm. you, in a sense, you know, when you start doing the blue, red, uh, you know, amber, green type of, uh, you know, the bragging type of stuff. Once you start doing it, mm. the others then, in some way, are, uh, you know. In, in a uh, soft way, pressurized to actually adopt it. So that's mm. that's the combination I use. But any transformation, my learning has been, you definitely need the leader of the business or the operation mm. to actually own it and lead it. And, mm. and you know, how do you get them and how do you use a combination of influence and control is what, uh, you know, yeah, it's a bit of a uh, science. It's a bit of an art as well. I, I think right. that's the way it Well said. And, uh, you know, when you work with leaders across industries, uh, across geographies, what have been some of your challenges and some of your learnings as you have helped these organizations to transform? My biggest learning has been that this, the most important ingredient for transformation to happen is the culture in the company. Right? Mm. It comes from the top. Mm. Right? So is the company and the leadership really wanting to transform themselves, you mm. know, are they keen on innovation? Everything helps continuous improvement. So, so culture is topmost. I mean, mm. right? followed by people. If you have the culture, you can find the right people, uh, mm. right? Uh, and then, to me, last is actually the approach or the framework that one takes. Mm. Right? So, in in order of sequence, that is what it is. I mean, so mm. most people focus on trying to get the right solutions or the right framework. But I feel if it is the other way, culture, people, framework, then it works well. Mm. My uh, challenge has been that, uh, you know, while most leaders eventually get them to, you know, understanding the impact it can have for their business and operation, mm. getting them to collaborate for a uh, overall good, mm. uh, for lack of a better word, is, is a bit of a challenge because most business leaders are in, in a competitive mode. They want to actually make changes. They, they are willing to you know, take risks and ensure that their processes and businesses are doing well. Mm. But you've been getting them to collaborate where one doesn't know what is it in for them. You know, how do you get a common purpose? Uh, it has always been, a, I won't say entirely, uh, always a challenge, but it's a challenging effort. You know, it, it requires a lot of work to ensure that they all get on the same page. Mm. Right? And they talk to each other, not in the presence of just someone who's leading transformation, but more as, uh, you know, as friends and peers and mm. willing to, you know, contribute to each other. Mm. Maha, you also spoke a little bit about culture. And uh, I have often seen in organizations uh, a culture where the young people or new people come and say, oh, this is how it happens here. And, you know, that's a very dangerous set of words to use because you already had accepted that the legacy systems will continue. What are your perspectives on how does one manage culture to be able to transform effectively? So, like I said, it, it uh, comes from the top. It's about the top leadership really, you know, uh, believing that, you know, this is the way to uh, go. Mm. So, I will give you a very uh, nice example. When I was working in Tesco, mm. uh, you know, one of my leaders came and said, Tesco is a huge organization. If mm. you're, you know, if you can either be at, a, uh, you know, at the inertia, place of inertia and not start, mm. or you can do something about it. And so he said, just believe that, in Tesco, forgiveness is better than permission. Mm. And uh, so how can leaders do this? So, so if you are wanting to have people take a level of accountability and risk in the way they are transforming, mm -hmm. then at the end of the transformation, whatever be the result, mm. right? 
great leaders will actually focus on the thought process behind the transformation or not just really at the end result. Mm. Right? And so if it is success, you take learnings from them. If it is failures, you celebrate and take learnings so that you don't repeat them. Right? Mm. But then if the focus is on the thought process and that's how the leadership and the culture is actually percolated, mm. uh, then I feel things like continuous improvement, Kaizen, all that can actually flower a lot more. Mm. Very interesting. Uh, one more question on transformation, uh, and then we'll move to customer experience. Most organizations are now seeing significant use of technology. And when I say technology, I mean, the technology has always been there. But now when we're talking about artificial intelligence, the latest, of course, is chat GPT, uh, and so many new things, you know, whether it's machine learning and so on and so forth. How is technology uh, changing the way organizations have to transform? So, uh, so I would say uh, technology essentially uh, enables scaling of transformation in a rapid manner. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Um, so on, on the efficiency side, it is about how do you implement technology and systems and things like you know RPA and all that mm -hmm. to ensure that the processes are compliant at scale. Mm -hmm. which is absolutely necessary because you're you know, wanting to get efficiency. Right? Mm -hmm. On the customer experience side of it, it is about, you know, how do you use, uh, you know, AI technologies, recommendation engines to really have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with customers using things like personalization, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do it at scale, Yeah. right? From employee productivity perspective, the things that you spoke about, like open AI, chat GPT and all that, so what is going to happen is at some point in time, context is going to be a lot more important than the technology set. It's already important, but mm -hmm. it will become increasingly important. So the people who know where to look for the opportunities, what questions to ask, mm -hmm. are going to be a lot more important than the people who answer those questions. Mm -hmm. Right? And, and so technology is going to, you know, almost empower these employees who can who have a business perspective and customer perspective mm -hmm. to succeed and scale quickly. Mm -hmm. right. So that's the way I look at it. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you for a great response. So, Maha, now let's talk about customer experience. You know, I was speaking at a conference a few uh, few months ago, and uh, I was mentioning and talking to many people. Customer experience is expected to be a one trillion dollar opportunity in the next ten years in India. Mm -hmm. um, and you've spent a lot of time uh, in the world of customer experience. How do you define customer experience? So, to me, the way I look at customer experience is it's a feeling of uh, trust uh, and comfort that you know a consumer or a customer develops with the company mm -hmm. as he or she moves through the you know various touch points of a customer journey, right? Right. And and uh, it it is in a sense a combination of uh, what is the value proportion of product or service the customer, you know, the company is offering to the customer, which is what I call as the what, right? Mm. The way it is delivered, which is the why, you know, the whole experience surrounding the delivery and consumption of that. Mm. Right? And a little deeper is the why part of it. Mm -hmm. right? um, so, you know, what is the core purpose beyond the company really providing that service, right? Mm. And at a very, very fuzzy level, every consumer actually in some form or shape uh, relates to it, right? Uh, and, and I think that's the overall feel of whether you feel positive about a company or negative about a company. Mm -hmm. That's the way, you know, I define customer experience. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you do a lot of work in the area of customer loyalty uh, and uh, customer experience. Uh, how do you support organizations to build their own customer loyalty and experience strategies? So, um, so the way I approach it is uh, in a few ways. The first mm. one is ensuring that the core value proposition that the company offers is in sync with the customer's needs, expectation, changing needs or expectations, whatever. Mm. Right? Mm. So how do you understand? So, you know, uh, so how do you create an ecosystem or a program of engaging with customers through a combination of, you know, incentivization engagement? So there is the reasonable amount of data mm -hmm. uh, and you know feedback and digital exhaust available about the customer that's the mm -hmm. first part i look at it to create a lot of relevant data right once the data is there how do you actually understand the data in a, a meaningful manner mm -hmm. and ensure that that is something uh, percolated or shared with everyone across the value chain of the product or the service proposition so mm -hmm. that they can be more customer centric in the products or the service that they get mm -hmm. 
Right. So how do they get a view? So every right. person in the value chain needs to have a, a view into how his or her work or whatever they are contributing is impacting the end consumer. Mm -hmm. Which is easier said than done, but then you know you can go through it. Mm -hmm. The second part is how do you then deliver that? So what is the type of uh, you know engagement mechanisms uh, that you can you know enable for the customer so that it's delivered friction. Right? Mm -hmm. So so for example, when I was working the landmark group. Uh, uh, 90% of our business is in stores. Uh, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, a typical fashion customer would buy three or four times in a year. So very few would actually have the e-commerce app on mm -hmm. their mobile. Mm -hmm. Most people would uh, uninstall them. Uh, but for us, if 90% of the business is actually coming from stores, you need a way of trying to understand who is in the store mm -hmm. uh, and then being able to personalize, engage with them, and then you can create data out of that engagement. Right. So, so how do you, so that's where you bring, you know, Innovation. So, you know, we had this whole thing of a digital store assistant where we said, don't download an app, scan a QR and open a PWA, what's a progressive web app or a thick website. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, so for a customer just walking in, doing the transaction, going out, now we've got data about the customer. Mm -hmm. We are able to make recommendations, get them to actually, you know, check out on their mobile itself. So mm -hmm. how do you provide that type of layer so that the customer, apart from the product, is feeling the service and, you know, uh, having uh, uh, you know a level of frictionless experience mm. and the third thing is it's a cultural thing that you know the back end actually trusting the front end to take decisions mm -hmm. you know how do you actually give those inputs so that the back end is willing to allow the front end to take certain calls which are customer responsive may not be defined mm. uh, but you know uh, empower them for that mm. so those are the three ways that we are interesting to that. very interesting you know there is another debate that has often been uh, you know, I've heard many times, a lot of companies have a customer care department. Mm. And uh, I've often heard people say that there should not be a separate department because customer care has to be a part of the DNA of every department in the company. I'd love to get your perspective. So I agree. So the way I would say it is customer centricity and customer empathy should be part of every department. Mm. I mean, uh, the customer care, uh, for some reason, in my mind, is always like, a, you know, a front end role uh, for someone who's, you know, the touch point with the customer, right? Mm. Be it the service desk, be it the help desk, be it the store staff, be it the delivery staff. These are the people in some sense, they are the customer care assistants because mm -hmm. they are the guys who are physically or in person interacting with customers. Right. Right. Um, but uh, what I would say is I would call the whole organization should have a customer empathy and how do you, you know, right. percolate that mm. uh, right? and and uh, that can happen only by every person in the value chain understanding his or her impact to the end consumer mm -hmm. and being comfortable with uh, you know giving away a level of their power to the front end staff to take decisions mm. like i said if i mean uh, may not be a great example if you take the current air india example that happened mm -hmm. uh, right uh, and empowered staff would have actually moved the lady to first class correct and maybe the you know while, while what happened was wrong from a customer perspective uh, you know it would have been a lot less possibly traumatic for her if, if correct only the you know the airlines had taken care of that mm. and, and that happened or did not happen for lack of empowerment correct so correct but what a great example thank you my next question to you maha is on culture uh, how does culture impact customer experience i mean i've come across companies uh, which react so quickly uh, that you actually left uh, feeling almost grateful someone responded to you. And there are some where I, I personally keep tweeting uh, and saying, you know, I'm not heard from you and they don't even bother to respond. Yeah. So, uh, so again, a couple of things. And, you know, I, I keep talking of this example of uh, two great companies and now they are in, uh, one company both, uh, you know, uh, renowned for customer service, right? Mm -hmm. On one side, you have Amazon, uh, which is absolutely frictionless in its experience, right? Correct. Or then they define experience as the person, in the customer actually shop something, there's nothing for them to remember about the fact that they purchased something because everything works like clockwork, right? Correct. I mean, the fact that you don't even remember anything is actually great frictionless experience. Mm. That's their looking at. It. And yeah. then you had Zappos which was essentially about saying we'll do whatever it takes for customers. So one was high-tech, low-touch, right? 
Zappos, possibly high touch, but maybe limited tech. Right? Mm. And both of them exemplary in the way, you know, looking at the end objective of how they want to service the customer. Mm. Right? So I think for every organization, first, like I said, it is about making sure that in the production service that they're offering, what is it that they want to offer to the customer and then mm. aligning the entire company and thought process around that. Right? Mm. Uh, so for a company like Zappos, it is about empowerment. Uh, for a company like Amazon, it is ensuring that, uh, you know, uh, most of the processes are automated to an extent mm. uh, that the ability for a customer to go astray or, you know, have friction is reduced mm. in the process. Mm. Yeah, right? So I think the company has to first make the core purpose of this is what I want to do. And then depending on its strength and the area it operates, it needs to work the back end for that. Mm. So that's the way I would look at it. Mm. I, I mean, we, in, when I was in Tesco, we had this values. Now, that's, values are another great way of doing it. We used to say, no one tries harder for the customer. Mm. So it was not just a statement. Yeah. I mean, I have seen things on a, shop, on a, on a store floor when you are actually with the CEO of, uh, you know, Tesco, and they are, you know, uh, let's say, reviewing something on the shelf. Mm. And there is an old lady trying to pick something from the shelf, you know, at the end of the, uh, you know, end of the aisle or whatever. Mm. Anybody, the universe guy or even the senior most guy would just walk across and help the lady. Mm. So it's okay, because, you know, it was perfectly acceptable. Correct. Right? Correct. And, and so that's, that is, you know, how do you demonstrate that value and culture? Mm. Very interesting. So I've got time for two more questions. And uh, my next question is really uh, going to combine both transformation and customer experience. If you were to take the example of Air India, which you just mentioned to me, and I've had some horrible experiences with Air India, you know, in its earlier avatar, what would be involved to transform the culture in an organization that has gone through this incredible transition from the public sector into the private sector, from the perspective of customer experience. So it's a tough one, isn't it? I mean, uh, so the first one is, uh, can they have an appreciation? So how, you know, so once they have changed hands, how do they have the current team and, and assuming the current team, you know, most of them continue, right? Mm. How do they have an appreciation of what is really happening externally, right? Correct. Uh, so that would be a great way of, I, I mean, Air India is Air India because possibly for the fact that it's been there and worked in a particular way, mm. it's also for the fact that maybe there's a lack of exposure, mm. right? Uh, so how do you give, so my 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 general belief is most leaders and people are well-meaning, mm. uh, they don't know how to get there. Right? Correct. Nobody does it intentionally, right? Mm. They just don't know the way to get there. Mm. So if we are able to give them the right set of exposure mm -hmm. with other airlines, with, you know, what great service looks like, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that could be a level of uh, change in, I mean, intention I'm assuming is always existing. It is just mm -hmm. about, you know, how do you get there type of stuff. Correct. Correct. Number one. Number yeah. two is, uh, so that that is a change in mindset or change in exposure. Yeah. Uh, uh, third is, uh, the, the second part is in terms of, you know, what type of processes and training and learnings that could happen, right? Mm. So, you know, uh, what if type of situations, you know, how can they do? Are there, you know, are there this type of learnings that can be passed on to them, mm. uh, right? And third is really uh, appreciate people who are doing a great job. So, mm. you know, how do you, you know, at, at every level, it could just be an air hostess, it could be, a, 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 you know, a person on the... Uh, um, you know, um, checking you in or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So mm -hmm. how? So when they do something which is great in terms mm -hmm. of customer experience or really given a wow moment to a customer, mm -hmm. how do they get uh, you know recognition? How do mm -hmm. people know about it? So that motivates right. others to do. So, right. Uh, yeah. So it's a combination of multiple I things. I agree. And I have time for one more question, and this is for the many many people who will listen to our conversation, Maha. Based on your own amazing journey and so much knowledge and experience you have, what would you say are three lessons you would want our viewers and listeners to take away? Um, so the first one uh, uh, is, uh, I would say that uh, keep learning mm -hmm. and and uh, stay curious. Mm. Right. Uh, I think that the, that's the first learning. Yeah. Uh, the second is it is uh, 
you know, when you do uh, transformation type of roles, uh, mm -hmm. you need to have the ability to be honest and have, you know, open, tough conversations. Mm -hmm. right? uh, because that is where your authenticity comes in. Yep. Right? Yeah. So, so how do you, you know, have the ability to say no with finish? Yeah. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I think that's the second thing. And the most important thing I would say is irrespective of whichever role someone is playing, mm -hmm. when in doubt, uh, right, your compass should be the end customer. Mm -hmm. right? uh, so, you know, if, if that is what it is, then, you know, eventually over the long run, the person will emerge as a winner. Mm, very and interesting. Very, very interesting. And on that note, and your three amazing lessons, keep learning, be curious. Second, like you said was uh, there must be honesty, openness, and toughness. Toughness to have a strong conversation and have the ability to say no. And uh, I must add a small personal experience. I've often said this that most of us in India don't have the ability to say no. It's okay. always whenever you ask someone, it's always ho jayega. I'll get it done. And the third one is focus on the end customer. Thank you, Maha, for speaking to me and talking to me about your own journey, talking to me about transformation and about customer experience. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.